So you you laid out three policy areas where you felt that you could work with with President Trump very effectively, health, speech and peace. And we've spent a fair bit of time concentrating on free speech and on peace and war. And I think we'll turn to that more, the peace and war issue on the Daily Wire side in, in the conclusion of our interview. But maybe we could close up, if you don't mind, with the with some more thoughts on the health crisis, because one of the things you've done that I think is unprecedented and that's become perhaps more part of the public discussion since you've teamed up with Trump is to make public health a political issue. And so you talked about the public health crisis and maybe you could lay out the dimensions of that crisis. I mean, I know there's an obesity epidemic, there's a diabetes epidemic. These are very, very serious problems. And so, but you've concentrated on that in a way that just isn't characteristic of anybody on the political landscape at all. Now it's become an issue that's front and center. And so I'd like to hear more about your thoughts, why you think that's such a fundamental um, uh, priority, you know, compared to say fr free speech and, and war and peace, why health and what you see, lay out the landscape of the problem and also the landscape of potential solution. Yeah, so, we are now the sickest country in the world. We have the highest chronic disease burden in the world. When my when my uncle was president, I was a you know ten year old boy. Um, about six percent of Americans had chronic illness, and today sixty percent. When my uncle was president, we spent zero in this country on chronic disease, zero, and. Uh, Today, and for many chronic diseases, first of all, there weren't even diagnoses and there weren't drugs available. Uh, um, today, we spend $4.3 trillion, so about 95% of our health budget is the biggest, um, and it's five times our military costs. It's the biggest uh, item in our budget, and it is the fastest growing. And uh, not only that, so it, it destroy, it's destroying our country economically, absolutely debilitating it. All of our other issues are small towards it. If you just measure its economic impact, it has other impacts. 77% of American children um, are no longer eligible for the military because of chronic disease. And is that obesity related uh, with kids? Obesity is one of them. You know, uh, obesity when my uncle was president was 3.4%. Today it's 74%. And what do you think is driving the obesity epidemic? Uh, it's being it's such a transformation. Yeah, I mean, it's being driven by poisoned food. By, um, you know, by uh, processed, uh, ultra processed wheat, sugar, and flour, seed oils, um, soy, canola, sunflower flour um and then uh, and then you know wheat and corn which are you know are um which are all all heavily subsidized so those 90 percent of farm subsidies the crop insurance etc go to those three categories of soy coin and wheat and um and those are the feedstocks for all of our processed foods. They turn into sugar. They're they're all nutrient barren. They you know the original crops were nutrient rich, but the GMO crops are nutrient barren, and they're heavily dependent on pesticides. The point of the way that the reason GMOs are so popular is because they're resistant to pests. The reason they're resistant to pests right, right. is because they are um, they are resistant to pesticides like glyphosate, so you can saturate the whole landscape with glyphosate from airplanes. And that the only thing that's green is GMO corn, which is, you know, which is uh, Roundup, Roundup Ready. It's called Roundup Resistance Corn. And because of that, it's also very, very heavily laden with, with pesticides, wheat. Um, uh, glyphosate is also used as a desiccant, which means it dries out wheat, so it's, it's sprayed on the wheat right at harvest, which means it's going right into the food. And when that began in 1993, that's when you saw all the, the appearance of all these gluten allergies and celiac disease and wheat allergies that you don't have in Europe. You know, you can eat spaghetti here and you're going to get eczema and all of these stomach complaints. Then you go to Italy and you eat it and you get thin. Mm -hmm. uh, but here, um, and then...
the, the corn has turned into high fructose corn syrup, which is just a formula for making you obese and diabetic. And, uh, and Americans, you know, diabetes is one of the diseases. When I was a kid, the average pediatrician saw one case of diabetes in his lifetime. So a 40 or 50 year career, he may see one case of juvenile diabetes. And today, one out of every three kids who walks through his office door is diabetic or pre-diabetic. And we spend more on diabetes than our military budget. So that is, you know, and nobody's talking about this. Yeah, right. And, you right. know, and then they, oh, these are the, 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 all of these autoimmune disease, diabetes, autoimmune disease, Alzheimer's is a form of diabetes. Mm -hmm. It's type three diabetes. Right, it right. comes from poison food. Oh, um, so is it? Is it the? Is it? How much of it do you think is the toxin load per se, and how much of it do you both. think is it's carbohydrate? It's the, it's, the it's the overload of sugars yeah. because all of those grains turn into sucrose, and and they're and they're very low in nutrients. So we're malnourishing. You know, you're seeing high levels of obesity, and in the same people, people who have high levels of, of obesity, there's also high levels of malnutrition. The most malnourished people in this country are the most overweight, right? Because they're eating, uh, they're okay. eating food like uh, food, food like, like substances. substances. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and then <laughs> that's a good phrase. And then you're they're, they're covered with with chemicals and pesticides. But some of those are part of the food processing, but some of them are pesticides, etc. There's a thousand ingredients in our food that are illegal in Europe and other countries. So we're just mass poisoning us and nobody has chronic disease epidemic like we do in our country. That's why one of the reasons we had the highest death rate from COVID. We, right, had, right. we had 16 percent of the COVID deaths in this country. We only have 4.2 percent of the world's population. <laughs> And so we did worse than any other country. And the, the CDC explains that says it's not our fault. It's because Americans are so sick. CDC said the average American who died from COVID had 3.8 right, chronic diseases. Right, right, right. So it wasn't COVID it was killing them. It was chronic disease, right? And, uh, and you know, we have the sickest, we have the highest chronic disease burden, we have the highest COVID death rate. And, and then, but it's not just, it's, it's those autoimmune diseases like rheumatoid arthritis, juvenile diabetes, lupus, Crohn's disease, all this IBS. All of these things had suddenly appeared in the mid '80s. That you know, I never knew anybody with any of those diseases when I was a kid. Yeah, right. The neurological diseases: ADD, ADHD, speech delay, language delay, tics, Tourette syndrome, narcolepsy, sleep disorders, uh, Tourette syndrome, ASD, autism. Autism rates in my generation, seventy-year-old men, is about one in between one in fifteen hundred and one in ten thousand. That's what it is today. My children's generation is one in every 34 kids, according to CDC, one in every 22 in California. So, you know, and it is, it is devastating our, our generation, it's our economy, it's gonna cause autism alone. So there's a recent, recent paper by Mark Blaxel that shows it'll cost a trillion dollars a year um, by 2030. And then, so then, then, then the uh, allergic disease again, which I never saw as a kid. I had 11 siblings, 70 first cousins. I never knew anybody with a peanut allergy. Mm -hmm. Why do five my, my seven kids have allergies? Uh, you know, it, it's. So you're up against some big, some major forces in fighting that particular battle. I mean, first of all, you have to sway public opinion in that direction, and then there's going to be uh, a massive force arrayed against any possible interventions, that's for sure. So what? Tell, tell me what you think you could do, and also tell me why you don't think you would be stopped. Well, I think they're gonna try to stop us, but I've been thinking about this for 40 years, so I know how to do it. And, uh, and you know, I've worked with Mark Hyman and Kelly Means and Casey Means and a lot of other people to figure out how to do it without having to go to Congress, uh, to do it all with executive orders and policy changes. And, you know, I'll give you one example. I mean, you can get fluoride out of the water by executive order out of the water systems all over the country. And that is, you know, that's a big issue with public health and cancer, et cetera. 
But there are other things like, well, it would be very hard. You never get congressional approval to, to, to ban glyphosate, which is causing all kinds of health problems and cancers all over this country. And so, um, but here's what you can do. You can, NIH has a budget of $42 billion a year, and it distributes that money to 56,000 scientists who are at research and at mainly universities in North America, and, you know, Canada, the United States, and, and some in Europe. And they're supposed to be doing basic science, but what they really do nowadays is they do drug development for the pharmaceutical industry. So NIH is now the primary incubator for new pharmaceutical drugs. And it changed that, that rule, that, that changed. NIH used to be the primary scientific agency in the world. It, it changed, that changed in 1980 because we passed a, a bill called the Bayh-Dole Act that allowed NIH itself and NIH scientists to collect royalties on any pharmaceutical product that they developed. So now that they follow the money and now what NIH does is they're in a partnership with pharma, they develop new products to treat chronic disease and, um, and anybody who tries to study the etiology, the origins, the causes of chronic disease, that scientist will be blackballed forever. And so what I'm going to do, at, you know, is change NIH and say we're going to we're going to make the primary purpose of this agency to develop science on what's causing chronic disease. So right now, there's very little science that says high fructose corn syrup causes diabetes. That's deliberate. We don't have that science because the agency does not want to see that science. I'm going to make sure that science happens. Not one study, but not just 20 studies, but 100 studies that show that. Now, what happens when you have 100 studies? There is a, a rule in the federal courts in this country called the Daubert Rule. And that says that if you believe you got sickened by a product, like, like say you think Coca-Cola made you obese, mm -hmm. You can't sue Coca-Cola unless there's at least a, a critical mass of studies, maybe 20 or 30, that say that that's what it does. So it's a liability enhancer. Well, the, the judge has to make that decision about whether you've passed the Daubert threshold before he allows you to go to, to, go to a jury. So in a big case, like when I was I tried the Monsanto case, I was part of the trial team, um, the big threshold is, can you pass Daubert? And, and we had about 20 studies that showed that uh, Monsanto, that Roundup caused non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. And we had mouse studies, we had rat studies, we had animal studies, bench studies, observational studies, epidemiological studies, so a good range of all different kinds of studies that show that once you get that critical mass, then you can go to a jury. And once that happens, the product is through. So when we, we sued Roundup, we had 40,000 home gardeners who had gotten non-Hodgkin's lymphoma from using Roundup in their backyards. And the way that you try multi-district litigation, you try one of those cases at a time, right at one after the other in rapid fire, till somebody says, uncle, you either lose them all and then, you know, it's not that you, you run out of money because it costs a lot of money to try a case, or you win them all and the, the, uh, the maker of that product then has to come to the negotiating table and, and settle it. Uh, we won $289 million in the first trial. We won $89 million in the second. The third trial, we asked for a billion dollars. We got $2.2 billion from the jury. And then Monsanto came to the negotiating table and we settled the cases for 13 billion and they agreed to take Roundup, to take uh, glyphosate out of home gardening products. Mm -hmm. Oh, Got that's it. what you do. Got it. You, yeah. Once enough science is out there, you don't have to legislate up against high fructose corn syrup. The lawyers are going to come right, out of the right, woodwork. Right. Okay. And they're going to be representing a million kids with diabetes. And the company is going to say, we're not going to make this product anymore.